So we're trying to be punctual in these evening talks. So most people are here and hopefully a few more might arrive. And uh, I'm also aware that a few people are following us on Facebook, which is lovely. And uh, apologies to those who are, because we can't take your questions in this particular uh, format. It's, uh, it's a natural retreat that's happening. So we have to prioritize the questions of the people on the retreat, but I'm glad that we can be uh, reaching many people thanks to our wonderful team and a lot of the preparation that went into place. So this is one of the beautiful aspects of the Dhamma, which is what I wanted to talk about today about the Dhamma as another anusati or recollection, something we can recollect on to bring about again, this confidence, this faith in the Buddha's teachings in the triple gem. And in a sense, the Dhamma is where the potency of the triple gem really lies because that is the teaching. So the Buddha is the doctor, you know, he diagnoses the disease he diagnoses the cause of that disease and, and, you know, lets us know that, yes, there is a way out. And then he prescribes the treatment, the medication, if you like. And that Dhamma is the medicine that brings the sweet relief from suffering. But it's important to remember that Dhamma can't bring that relief just by, you know, for example, if the, you go to the doctor and he gives you some medicine or she gives you some medicine and you bring it home and you just put it like on a shelf somewhere, you know, and you close the cupboard and maybe it's out of your reach, you, you forget all about it. It's just somewhere up on a shelf and you never actually take that medicine. Or sometimes maybe you get out the prescription and you just read all about the benefits of that medicine, you know, all the things it's supposed to do and how it works against the cause and how it alleviates the disease, but you just, you know, intellectualize it. And then you have discussions with your friends and say, well, my medicine is much better than your medicine because look, it has these properties and it has no side effects and yours has more side effects. It's better to take this kind of medicine. But still, you're only reading about that medicine. You haven't taken it. You don't really know its potency. You don't really know its effects. And then uh, the other simile that my teacher, first teacher, Goenkaji, used to say is... Um, some people bring that medicine home and they put it on the altar. They put it, you know, with the Buddha statue and they light the incense and then they start praying to the medicine. <laughs> oh, medicine, please bring me relief. You know, please cure my disease. And all they do is circumambulate the medicine and, you know, bow down to the medicine. And this doesn't work because they never actually take that Dhamma pill. <laughs> so the beautiful thing about this Dhamma treatment is that it's... Um, it's very uh, effective right away, and yet it is also a long-term treatment. And we have to finish the whole course of that treatment. It's not enough just to take the medicine for a week and then say, well, it's not really you know, bringing me any benefits, so I'm going to give up with this medicine and try something else. We have to actually take the medicine with confidence, with faith, knowing that it came from the Buddha, the Buddha who himself eradicated his own disease you know, his own disease of suffering and, and uprooted it right from the depths of his heart, uprooted that greed, hate and delusion, which the Buddha did call a disease, especially anger he likens to a disease, you know, like a person who's full of anger is like a sick person, they've lost their mind, they're not seeing things properly. And we also, of course, have the Sangha, which I'll talk more about tomorrow, but I think it's so valuable and important to have living representatives of what happens when we do take the treatment for longer periods of time. And, you know, to qualify as someone who can inspire you on the path, you don't have to have finished the medicine, you don't have to have completely uprooted the disease, but you can see that these people are starting to regain their health, they're getting that glow. As Ajahn Brahmali said, they start to shine amongst their relatives <laughs> or amongst their peers, amongst their friends. You know, you see, oh, these people have a lightness. They have a buoyancy. There's something there. You know, maybe they still get upset from time to time, but they bounce back fairly quickly. They have a certain resilience. And that comes from knowing that they've got this course of treatment that's going to cure the disease. So we can already start rejoicing even before we get all the benefits. Right. <clears throat> and of course, sometimes we might uh, be quite surprised in the beginning when we go to the doctor and, you know, we get diagnosed and then we realize how deep rooted our disease really is. You know, this kind of um, pervasive nature of the defilements, we can clear them away for a while and then they come back in and again cloud the mind. 
So sometimes it can be a little bit upsetting in the beginning. You know, we think we're making progress and we are. Every time we put a drop in the jar, every time we take a step on the path, we are making progress. But then lo and behold, when you're not aware of it, you know, something comes up from behind and seems to, you know, knock you over, so to speak, or, you know, you start to doubt whether you're really progressing at all. You see these tenacious habits that just keep coming back again and again. And this is where we really need the confidence to know that these results don't come immediately. You know, it is working bit by bit, but um, it might not always be pleasant in the beginning. And there's another sutta in the um, text which talks about the um, types of feelings, types of Vedana that we can experience. And the Buddha talks about pleasant feelings that arise through virtue, right? but also pleasant feelings that arise through non-virtue. And then he says there are certain types of unpleasant feeling that arise through virtue, right? And there are types of unpleasant feeling that arise through non-virtue. So of course, it's the non-virtuous, unpleasant and pleasant feelings that we need to be wary about. But sometimes even virtuous acts can have unpleasant results in the beginning. For example, you might have to make short term sacrifices, maybe, you know, you could get perhaps a really good um, uh, boost to your pay, you know, by getting some kind of special award for being the school's best teacher. They tried to do that to my dad, actually. They tried to give him a special award as an incentive, you know, to kind of say well done with your service and your work. But my dad's always been quite a socialist in principle, and I was so proud of him that he declined that pay. You know, and that was about three or four thousand pounds that he had to sort of let go of. And, and yeah, maybe there was some unpleasantness about it, especially because I don't think my mother was um, altogether 100 percent happy about it. But uh, I may be wrong in case she's listening. But um, but, you know, it, it leads to long term happiness. So sometimes there may be short term unpleasant effects, but we're more interested in Buddhism about the longer term effects, you know, what is leading to happiness in the long run. So sometimes on the path, we don't feel that it's going in the right direction or we, we do feel perhaps even that the suffering is becoming more apparent and maybe even seems as though it's being exacerbated. But we have to look, take a long term view and just check, you know, how are you doing like a couple of years ago? How are you doing like 10 years ago? How is your life generally moving along? And I found this also really wonderful when I had this melanoma that I um, talked about a few days ago, because um, I, d I didn't really know whether I was really 100 percent satisfied with my life. I, I still have some doubt sometimes about the path that I'm on right now because there's so much busyness involved and there's such a sense of responsibility and sometimes it seems like I'll be taking on more and more of that you know rather than lessening my burdens lessening and simplifying my life so I wasn't 100% sure how I'd feel you know if I only had a limited time left but when I actually realized that could be a possibility and of course it always is I was quite blown away by the fact that I, I just felt like I could really rejoice in my life. I really felt, wow, whatever I've done, however hard it's been, however many sacrifices I've made, so-called sacrifices on the way, actually everything I've done has tried to be to the best of my capacity for the Dhamma, to spread, to practice, you know, to share the Dhamma. And it gave me so much joy and confidence that, you know, when I am having to leave this body, perhaps there's something I can really rejoice about. And we just don't know that at the time. Sometimes it seems so hard, but Ajahn Brahm always says hard things or good things rather, worthwhile things, virtuous things are hard to do. It's easy to do bad things. It's easy to do immoral things. Of course, it's not so easy if we have this moral conscience and moral caution, my preferred translation of Hiri Otapa. But for people that, you know, are more careless and not so scrupulous and not so established on the path, it's very easy to just follow the requirements, you know, and to think that's fine, not to see the danger in that, just to see the short term pleasure. Right. So this Dhamma is for the long term and bit by bit, the disease starts to become cured. So what is the Dhamma? according to the Buddha. And of course, the first way of understanding the Dhamma is the teachings of the Buddha, 
right? The actual teachings that he gives. So in short, that would be the Dhamma and the Vinaya. So the restraining um, precepts for monastics. Um, and also basically like a roadmap, like a, a guide. And that roadmap always comes back to the Eightfold Noble Path. Right? Eightfold Noble Path is the Dhamma, it's the teachings of the Buddha. That is the way, the path we have to tread. And just to go through it very briefly now to talk about it in terms of the gradual training, which is one of the most repeated themes in the whole Pali Canon. I think it's discussed. I, I could sort of rattle off a few places like Majima 51 and 125, I think, but also most of the first suttas in the Digha Nikaya all talk about this gradual training that starts, as Ajahn Brahmali said earlier, with a little bit of an appreciation about suffering, you know, maybe not a deep and penetrative understanding yet, because if we had that, we really would let go of this whole mass of suffering that is human existence, right? If we really could see the pervasive nature of suffering, even in the Brahma realms, even in the Deva realms, you know, then, then we'd be basically enlightened, but to have an appreciation that the fact that there is suffering and we can't actually avoid it our whole life. I remember years ago in Thailand, it was really extraordinary. I'd started to meditate for two or three years by then. And I got into this conversation with this traveler at a restaurant like you do. And he was absolutely adamant that he could avoid suffering, that he was smart enough, he could just arrange things so that he didn't have to experience suffering. And I question him so thoroughly on it all, you know, about well, what if, you know, even simple things like if the weather's really bad, well, I'll just go somewhere else where the weather's good. Yeah, but what if you don't have money to go there? Well, you know, I'll go and earn some money. Well, what if you, you know, your relationship falls apart? Well, you know, I can always get another relationship, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, even to the point where I was saying about death and dying, he was just, no, no, he can control it all. He doesn't have to suffer. And I just thought, wow. What a deep delusion that is, you know, <laughs> because one of the benefits actually of practicing um, Vipassana, observing the Vedana in the body, the arising and passing of sensations is that you start to realize that even pleasant sensations is quite an agitation on the mental piece. It's quite agitating in the mind. And even that pleasantness can be kind of, yeah, like an irritation, like an agitation on peace. And so it doesn't mean that you suffer more though. This is the amazing thing about the Buddha's teaching. It actually enables you to develop equanimity towards all that and not invest your energy and time in those things, but then look more deeply inside for peace, for happiness. And so with this appreciation of suffering, we start to turn towards virtue. We start to live a more ethical life, which is aligned with our deeper values. Yeah. And it doesn't only include, you know, abstaining from doing harm. It also includes actively doing good, actively using words, speech, you know, using our bodies in ways that serves and supports other people, in ways that uplifts the heart of others, you know, that conveys the Dhamma in inspiring ways, um, that encourages people on the path, that points out to them their good qualities. And of course, we can use that internally too and encourage ourselves right so it's also about promoting beauty promoting goodness like shining up the mind and then um, this virtue also includes things like simplicity contentment gratitude these are almost like the outcomes of a virtuous life as we start to gain more and more happiness inside we find we don't need so much in the material world and I know for myself, the happiest times of my life have been when I've had very little, you know, just carrying around a few things and with all the freedom in the world, just to go and to practice and to serve others and to see others benefiting from this path. It's just been so enriching and so wonderful and freeing not to know that you don't need very much. It's incredibly freeing to know that. And of course, that simplifies one's life. You don't need to worry about so much where you sleep or you know, where you're going next, because you know that wherever you go, you carry that virtue, that goodness inside. And so the Buddha says that the result of this virtuous life, this virtuous um, mind, if you like, is a bliss that is blameless. We experience a bliss that is blameless. And it can be a subtle thing that takes time to tune into and notice. 
because the opposite of that is a kind of restlessness and remorse, a regret, maybe a guilt over our bad conduct. And we very rarely take the time to notice the absence of those things. You know, the absence of having a heavy heart, the absence of feeling remorseful and regretful, that is a kind of happiness. And it takes a little while to tune into it, but it's wonderful to have a, you know, a healthy conscience, a good, clean conscience when you go to bed at night, you know, practicing a bit of metta and just, no matter what happened in the day, you begin with metta, <laughs> you establish a good intention, and then you can go to sleep with metta. So you can forgive, you can, you know, end in a good way so that when you go to sleep, your mind is as clean and as settled and calm and satisfied as possible. And from here in the um, gradual training, the Buddha then starts to talk about sense restraint, which is a kind of mental virtue. So we're starting to take virtue into the way we use our mind. And there are two kinds of aspects to this. One is using sense restraint to quieten the mind. So lessening the kind of input that we allow in, you know, carving out more time alone, carving out periods of solitude in your life, time in nature, uh, just time to do nothing, you know, time to close your eyes, meditate, go inside. And, and maybe, you know, just toning down the kind of, um, the kind of, what do you call it, when something's like flashing and bright, you know, like some movies are just really stimulating and kind of, just kind of play back in your mind for hours after you see them. So we start to see, oh, actually, that's quite agitating, quite disturbing. Let me watch something more like a nature program or whatever it might be, or listen to a Dhamma talk. So this is one kind of sense restraint. We're sort of calming things down. We're starting to get a taste for subtler things, less input, and realize that actually that is more freeing, that is more peaceful and easeful than anything else. That started happening for me after my first retreat because I was so obsessed with music that before I went to India, I, I spent hours and hours putting thousands of my favorite songs onto little cassette recorders. But I only wanted to take about three because I wanted to travel light. So I had to choose, you know, <laughs> all these songs and I took so long about it. But then when I got to India and realized just what a completely different culture it is and how fascinating and kind of all consuming in a way that it was I just wanted to learn I just wanted to be present to whatever was happening and I hardly listened to this music at all you know I preferred to hear the Indian ladies on the buses talking and maybe the goats kind of <laughs> on the top of the bus or just be in nature just be with the natural sounds which were plenty I can tell you that <laughs> so slowly I started to kind of move away from purposely stimulating the senses and just learning to, you know, be at ease and be present to whatever was happening right around me. And then the next kind of um, sense restraint is more of a guarding or a protecting of the senses than really um, stopping ourselves looking at things. Or It's more about using wisdom to attend or perceive or, um, yeah, attend to things in a way that doesn't lead to suffering, in a way that actually increases the wholesome states of mind and starts to diminish and restrain the unwholesome states of mind. So the way we regard a friend, the way we regard someone who irritates us, we try to look at it in different ways. We try to look at some of their qualities and not only the things that irritate us, yeah. Or if, for example, we have a lot of lust, and you know, you see a certain person that you find very attractive, you can try to regard them in a different way. Either look for what's unattractive, maybe imagine them waking up in the morning with bad breath or <laughs> whatever it is that might help, or you know, see them in a beautiful way, like this is just like my mother or my sister, or my brother. You know, think of them differently, think of them as a suffering being, a fellow companion on the path. Not to say that, you know, you can't have dumber relationships and good relationships in life, but if it's, you know, something that's just really motivated by lust to the extent that your mind is taken over by that, we learn to look in a different way that will bring us back to a kind of balance and stop those defilements getting kind of out of hand. 
And then basically from this, we go into what Ajahn Brahmali or Bhante Sajata have been translating as situational awareness, which is basically Sampajanya in whatever we do. So using wisdom and mindfulness to know the purpose of what we're doing and whether it's appropriate to the context. So it's all very well to do your slow-ish walking meditation when you know, you're in your room or when you're in you know, a fairly private place. <clears throat> but would that really be some pajanya? Would that be wise mindfulness if you were trying to cross a busy street? You know, at that point, you can be mindful of the body moving quickly. Sometimes you might even have to run if you've misjudged the traffic lights. So you can be mindfulness, mindful of moving quickly, and that is appropriate and suitable to the context. So we have to know what we're doing and why. And that increases mindfulness to the point where we're able to either in the gradual training, it goes then into sitting down cross-legged and practicing with breath and going into the jhana states. And I think in the Dantabhumi Sutta, it first goes into the Satipatthanas, the four Satipatthanas, which include um, observing the body, the sensations or feelings in the body and mind, and the mental contents and the mental states, the mind itself. But the two are very similar and Ajahn Brahmali, I hope, will speak about that later and say about how the Anapana method basically completes the four Satipatthanas. It includes observation of Vedana because we start to observe the piti, the joy, the pleasant feelings in the breath. It, uh, it includes observation of the mind because the breath becomes mental, it becomes a mental object. And we start to understand our mind at quite a deep level, especially around things like letting go, when to let go of the object and to move into the world of the mind. So, so either of these methods are part of the gradual training. And of course, the Brahma Viharas is always there as well. The four divine abidings is part and parcel of the Dhamma. And even if you don't make those your main vehicle and cultivate them a lot in the beginning, it's very uh, much a part of the practice later on. And in many suttas, you know, actually after the four jhanas, somebody starts um, abiding in the Brahma Viharas and taking those to the deep jhana states, especially people who are um, very pure of heart, it becomes a frequent abiding for them, you know, and it almost becomes their fuel, their energy source. So that when they teach and share the Dhamma, it's not coming from a sense of self or will or craving, but it's coming from just the Brahma Viharas. That is really what spurs them on, what keeps them going. You know, it's also one of the answers to how does an Arahat continue to exist, you know, because there's no craving, there's no um, defilement there at all. But basically they're running on these Brahma Viharas, they're running on metta, on compassion, on mudita and on equanimity. So these become the nature, if you like, of that person's mind, the inclination of the mind to the point where it becomes their character. Very, very beautiful to see, you know, people who developed it to this degree. It's just really inspiring. And then the second aspect of the Dhamma is not only the teachings, it's also where those teachings are leading to. So this is known as the consequence and the Pali word is adigamma, uh, which kind of means like the higher, um, I'm not sure exactly how you split that up, but adi is usually higher. So it's more like the realization of those teachings, if you like the path and the fruits, you know, the actual fruits of stream entry, of once returning, non-returning and full enlightenment, arahat. So this is where we want to be leading and we have the outfall path to show us how. So I wanted to quickly go through some of the qualities that the Buddha talks about, um, about the Dhamma, as we have done for the Buddha. And, uh, and this again comes from Majjhima Nikaya number seven, but also many other places in the suttas. And it's the sort of list of qualities that we often chant in monasteries, especially in Thai forest tradition or forest tradition. Um, we often chant these things. And the first quality of the Dhamma, apart from all of these things we've discussed, that it leads to freedom, that it has the taste of freedom, the first quality is actually swakato, and that basically means that it's clearly stated, it's clear, it's taught clearly in a relevant way with ordinary language that people can understand. 
right? It's relatable. It's not just a boring, monotonous sermon given just purely from the intellect or from the books. It's something that actually means something and can help people in their lives, right? Even these days, we have so many different ways of conveying the Dhamma from the books and, you know, going to monasteries, but also through YouTube and Facebook, social media, through iPods. I've got my own little iPod with thousands of talks, especially thousands by Ajahn Brown, actually, <laughs> thousands. And uh, I call it my pocket Ajahn because, yeah, I can't put actually Ajahn Brown in my pocket. So instead I have the iPod, which is, you know, pretty much as good, I have to say which is very nice so it has to be clear it has to be clearly explained and relevant and it's surprising in a sense right that for something as deep as the dhamma that's the first quality discuss because again if we can't understand it what point is it what's the use of it you know if we can't actually take that medicine if it doesn't make sense to us there's so much packaging on it you know we don't even recognize it as medicine or it looks like medicine from kind of 2,600 years ago. It just doesn't, it looks too old. <laughs> it looks full of dust and maybe turned really yucky. Then it's not going to work. So it has to be clear. And the second one is sanditiko, which is sometimes translated as apparent here and now. And I think there's a very good reason for that because it is, uh, you know, visible now. Every moment that we sit down quietly with our mind and we incline to peace. That's a moment of Dhamma. We can experience some benefit from that. Recently at the end of my um, weekly chanting sessions, which we didn't do this week because of the retreat, I um, just end with a minute's meditation. And sometimes in our daily life, we think, what's the point of a minute? I mean, I've got to sit for an hour. There's no point sitting for less than that. I won't get anywhere. But it's really amazing even to me that one minute can make a huge difference. You know, it's just like just stopping and recollecting, collecting our mind. It's a very beautiful thing to learn to do at any point in the day. You know, you might be washing the pots and you started off mindfully feeling the water, knowing what you were doing, being careful of the knives. You know, you were kind of present and then the mind goes somewhere. You can just stop and just breathe. You know, even one breath, right? Even one breath. Or you can just stop and close your eyes for a moment and immediately you kind of recenter yourself and reset your priorities. Another um, way of interpreting that is that the Dhamma is apparent and attainable, let's say, in this very life, which I quite like too. That's Ajahn Brahm's favorite way to uh, translate it because it differentiates it from other religions such as Christianity and religions that talk a lot about um, what's going to happen in the afterlife you know, as if you're good now, you do good things now, and it'll all come right after death, you'll go to heaven. And, you know, of course, I hope that most Christian people are getting benefit now. <clears throat> and with a proper understanding of any spiritual path, we will be trying to do good and benefit others, benefit ourselves. But still, a lot of the weight is put on the next life, <clears throat> if you like. And in Buddhism, we also have that concept, but we don't consider heaven the end or the final goal. We're much more concerned with how we're using our life now and actually experiencing some of these heavenly realms in this physical human form. Isn't that amazing? We can go and you know, experience heaven as human beings. We can go beyond heaven into the Gramalokas, the Jhana realms. That's beyond, I think, the, or maybe it's the same as the Christian heavens. You know, Some Christian mystics, I think, did get into those Jhana states. And then the Dhamma is also timeless. It's timeless, akaliko. And in a way that shows how universal it is, you know, that it transcends time and cultures and civilizations. You know, it's always talking about this basic nature of the human mind. But akaliko can also mean, you know, the timeless nature of the deep meditation states that you lose time altogether. There's this really sweet story, I'm not quite sure whereabouts it is, but it's um, of a couple of people, married couple, I think, or I don't know how they get married, but they're in the Deva realm. I don't know if they can really get married, but anyway, they're partners. And, uh, <laughs> and then one day uh, after lunch or something, I'm not sure what they eat, probably just bliss, um, the husband disappears. 
And, uh, and what's actually happened is that he's died and he comes to the human realm and he lives a full human life. Like he has, you know, all the usual trials and tribulations of being human, having to grow up, having to wear nappies, you know, having to learn to walk again and then go to school and get told off and have to do your homework, going through life, going through marriage and, you know, a job and things working out, other things not working out. And eventually he passes away at around the age of 70. And then he goes back to that same Deva realm and he meets his wife from the Deva realm again. And she says, oh, what happened? You've begun all afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just a it's just a couple of hours for them it's just an afternoon maybe four hours so isn't this amazing the time is so different and that's why they say devas live for eons because those eons probably just feel like a normal human lifespan to them <laughs> time really does kind of pass them by they're enjoying so much you know but eventually they have to come back but it really puts the human life into perspective doesn't it when you think it's just like an afternoon in the devas life <laughs> And then the next quality is ehi pasiko. It means come and see yourself. They used to use the word ehi when they ordained bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. Ehi bhikkhuni. The Buddha would just say ehi bhikkhuni. Come bhikkhuni. To a laywoman, right? And that was her ordination. Or ehi bhikkhu. Just come. Enter the sangha. And he'd give them the robe and they'd be ordained. Nowadays, we have to fly many bikunis in from all over the world to get an ordination done because there aren't many of us in one place. So we have to have these, you know, international uh, ordinations and it takes quite a lot to organize. But in the past, it was like, come and see, just come and ordain. But ehi pasiko means come and see for yourself. Come and see the Dhamma. Come and taste the Dhamma. Come and see if it works for you. That also hints to me at its accessibility. Dhamma should be accessible. There shouldn't be a paywall by which people miss out. Of course, sometimes, you know, and we've had to do it ourselves. We've had to rent really expensive venues and we have to basically charge for the food and the board. But, you know, as much as possible, it shouldn't be turned into a business that precludes certain people being able to join. So we want to make it accessible. And if somebody's really struggling, of course, we try to give bursaries. And ideally, you know, if we get our monastery, everything will be on a donation basis. And perhaps we can even have small retreats there, which are all on the donation basis. This is the wonderful thing about monasteries, you know, and just coming to be able to practice in daily life with some meditation, but also some service. And this really starts to help us to apply the Dhamma in life. And then the next quality is called opaneko, which means kind of like leading onwards or leading forward, if you like. And it's a funny one because, of course, with the practice, we're supposed to go within rather than on to the next thing. We're supposed to go deeper and deeper in. But I think it really means, you know, in a conventional way that there is a process that's leading in the right direction. We're moving forward in that sequence from suffering to happiness and ever increasing peaceful bliss. And then the last quality is pachatam vedita bovinyuhi, and that means um, to be experienced by the wise, yeah, to be experienced by every wise person. It can be experienced by anybody. The Dhamma is there to be experienced, yeah, and understood. And I think wise in this context just really means that our faculties are intact, more or less, you know, that we have the capacity to understand that we suffer and to understand that there's a way out. It doesn't mean we have to be particularly clever or even wise in the beginning. Most of us are very deluded and that's why we, you know, come to the path. But at least we're wise enough to know that we're deluded. And maybe that's what makes some of the difference with people who turn to the Dhamma path. We know that we're deluded and we want to change that. You know, we, we do understand and have faith that there may be a way out. So just, you know, it doesn't matter how intelligent you are. Ajahn Brahm tells this story about... Um, a monk in Thailand who apparently couldn't even get through to the second year of his uh, primary school because he just couldn't retain anything. He couldn't retain any information or any knowledge of what he'd done, you know, previously. And he had to keep repeating even this uh, primary school. But then eventually they sent him to a forest monastery and his mind was so simple, so pure that he just was told to watch the breath, watch the breath, and ended up getting into very deep meditation quite easily. 
and became one of the great monks. But unfortunately, Ajahn Brown doesn't remember exactly which great monk that was. But it just shows, you know, that you don't have to be particularly intelligent or, you know, um, a specialist in any particular field. All kinds of people come to the Dhamma, and that's why it is so amazing and so universal. So you'll see most of these qualities of the Dhamma are that universe, universality, right? That doesn't, um, that enables everybody to approach the path. And then I did want to end just by saying one or two little verses that I really love um, that talk about the consequence and how we can know that we're practicing the Dhamma, right? Because it's easy to talk about the content of the Dhamma, but how do we really know whether it's the Dhamma? And that can be known by where it leads, yeah? It can be a kind of um, guiding light, if you want, as to whether we're leading in the right direction or not. And one of the places that this is discussed is in that it's in the Anguttu Nikaya and the Buddha speaking to the first bhikkhuni, his own maternal aunt, um, the Venerable Mahapajapati Gautami. And she comes to him and she says, it would be good if the Blessed One would teach me the Dhamma in brief, such that having heard the teaching of the Blessed One, I might dwell alone, withdrawn, heedful, ardent and resolute. And then the Buddha says to her, just very simply, he gives her a kind of guideline to know whether it's the Dhamma and the Vinaya or not. He said, those things of which you might know lead to passion and not dispassion, lead to being fettered and not unfettered, lead to accumulating and not shedding, lead to strong desires, not fewness of desires, to company, not to solitude, to laziness, not to aroused persistence, to being burdensome and not unburdensome. You may categorically hold that this is not the Dhamma, this is not the Vinaya, this is not the teacher's instruction. But those things of which you might know lead to dispassion and not to passion. That's viraga, as opposed to raga. Lead to being unfettered, not to being fettered lead to shedding, not accumulating, to fewness of wishes, not strong desires, to solitude, not to company and entanglement, to aroused persistence, not laziness, to being unburdensome to others, this means, and not to being burdensome. You may categorically hold, you may know for sure, that this is the Dhamma, this is the Vinaya, this is the teacher's instruction. So it's very beautiful to see that it can be so simple. We just have to know for ourselves which direction things are leading. And I don't know, I've gone a bit over my time as usual, but do you think you can cope with one more verse or is it too much information? Because the next one is really beautiful. It's even more beautiful. And it's very similar to the last. So I'll see if I can read the, the whole thing out because it's just very beautifully written. If I can find it. So this is a similar um, passage, but this refers to the Venerable Upali. So the last one for those who are really interested in the suttas is Anguttara 853. And this one is Anguttara 783. So this is the teaching to Venerable Upali, who was a barber before in his lay life. And he approaches the Blessed One, pays homage to him and sits down by one side. He said, Bhante, it would be good if the Blessed One would teach me the Dhamma in brief, so that having heard the Dhamma from the Blessed One, I might dwell alone, withdrawn, heedful, ardent, and resolute. And then the Buddha says, Upali, those things which you might know thus, these things do not exclusively lead to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. You should definitely recognize and this is not the Dhamma. This is not the discipline. This is not the teaching of the teacher. But those things which you might know thus, these things lead exclusively to disenchantment, 
viraga, to dispassion. Oh, sorry, disenchantment is nibida, nibida, like um, turning away from things. To dispassion, that's viraga. To cessation, niroda. To peace, upasama. To direct knowledge, abhinya. To enlightenment, sambodhi. And to nibbana, you should definitely recognize this is the Dhamma. This is the discipline. This is the teaching of the Buddha. <laughs> Very beautiful words. So if we can keep those in our mind and keep those in our meditation, ask ourselves, is that the way we're inclining? Then we can be confident that we're on the path. And you're not always going to be inclining that way, but that doesn't mean you're not on the path. It's just gradual, gradual, gradual. So shall we do some meditation? So as we close our eyes, we're already turning away from the world of diversity, of form. And simplifying. Turning away from the path of suffering, turning toward the path of peace, the path that goes within. Just taking a few moments to acknowledge your wisdom the fact that you can infer or you have a sense that this is where true happiness lies. You are taking the medicine of the Dhamma every time you sit down to purify the mind, to incline towards stillness, towards peace. I find it really helpful at the beginning of all our meditations to establish mindfulness along with kindness in relation to the body because the body gives feedback straight away as to whether you are being kind or whether you are pushing your body about reacting with craving and aversion to any sensations that are pleasant or unpleasant. You can easily notice that because mindfulness combined with kindness tends to relax, release any struggle
And as a result, gradually, slowly, tensions start to melt away. almost imagine if you wish that the body is like a hard block of ice and as this kindfulness starts to suffuse your body it starts to melt soften tensions start to drain away might even help to settle just by breathing out a little longer in the beginning without any force but just lengthening the out breath very slightly to notice the relaxing effect and then coming back to natural breathing. just allowing your mind to settle on whatever perception feels simple. It might be just staying with a friendly, kind presence to the sensations in your body. Or maybe befriending Resting your mind on the breath. Whatever it is. See if you can let go of any burdens, anything you don't really need in your body, in your mind. Sometimes I ask myself, what can I abandon? Then I may just notice there's some tension I'm holding on to, or some thought that I don't really need to follow. And it helps the mind to just incline to the simplicity
If you find your mind is thinking, wondering, see if you can also notice the space between each word. Turning again and again to whatever experience is right in front of the mind. Not concerned with the last moment or the next moment, but just this moment. Just this part of the breath. Noticing the silence, the peace that's inherent in the breath. And that peace is not nothing, but it carries its own 
very quiet, subtle joy, perhaps different from the experience of joy in the world. The joy of contentment, the joy of peace. See if you can notice that, however subtle it may be. Keeping this joy connected with the breath, not leaking out to the other senses, but just there in the background as you settle more and more closely, become more and more content with this simple, humble breath. Allowing everything to settle. Allowing things to fade.
You can know that you're practicing the Dhamma. If it leads to this turning away from the world, to dispassion, cessation, the ending of things, it leads to upasama, to peace, to abhinya, higher knowledge, to sambodhi, to nibbana. Every time you take a step towards peace, you notice peace, appreciate peace in the mind. You are on the path to Nibbana. You can know this is the teaching this is the Vinaya, the discipline. This is the teaching of the Buddha. So before we finish this meditation, we can just reflect a little bit and notice what led to peace deepening in the mind. Did it come about as the result of abandoning things, putting down burdens, of picking things up. Did it come about due to company or due to solitude? Due to silent meditation? Could you experience the joy of peace? Good. Actually, we all enjoy peace, I think. You know, most people choose their holidays somewhere beautiful in nature or by the sea. Some people go to New York, I don't know, and go shopping or whatever. <laughs> but after a while, they need to get into Central Park or <laughs> some other place where they can see some trees. We do have that natural inclination. First it can seem boring, but later on we start to get a taste for peace. It becomes energized. 
So now is the time for some questions. If there are any after that, maybe nothing. I'll try not to go over tonight, so we'll probably have a fairly short Q&A session. <laughs> That's my plan anyway, we'll see. <laughs> so someone's asking about that sutta that talks about the 32 marks of a great man, the Lakana Sutta Diganikaya number 30. Yeah, it's in the Majjhima as well. I forget which number, one something. 100 and something anyway. What are my thoughts on such a strange sutta? Uh, that it's a strange sutta, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think there has been some research by scholars like Ajahn Bamali and Bantinalio who suggest that it's possibly added later, but I don't know enough about it to tell you in detail whether there's been a definite conclusion there or not. Um, but it doesn't really fit with the general sort of spirit of the early Buddhist texts. They don't normally, you know, talk about the Buddha in terms of his physical attributes very much, only in ways that might inspire, such as the glow on his face or the peaceful smile, or like I said yesterday, that humility of the Buddha just walking into a, a shed, you know, and asking the other monk, who was actually his student, he would have known if he can stay, you know, and that sort of hum humbleness of a Buddha, I think is usually, and also the mental qualities of a Buddha is usually what's emphasized. So it seems a little bit strange and something that could have been added maybe at the second council or so to, because people, human beings always have this wish to kind of um, put people on pedestals, you know, and project a lot of stuff onto others and sort of make them seem almost godlike and almost unreachable that the Buddha must have been like superhuman. He couldn't have been just like me. Um, but I actually think it makes him more worthy of reverence to realize he was a human being with all the, you know, imperfections of the human mind. And uh, yeah, someone was writing to me earlier actually about thinking and the kind of struggle that we can have with our thoughts and whether that's bad karma to have unwholesome thoughts. But even the Buddha had unwholesome thoughts before he was enlightened. And that is in his last life, right? They talk about that in the... Um, in the Dveda Vitaka Sutta, he says that, you know, unwholesome thoughts came into his mind. Thoughts of lust, thoughts of harming even, mm -hmm. thoughts of ill will came into his mind. But the difference was you could notice that and put them aside. But we do that too. So just because those thoughts come into your mind, don't think that means you're not practicing. It just means you haven't completed the goal. So yeah, I don't give too much store or stock or whatever you say to those sorts of things. It doesn't inspire me, but maybe it inspires some people and then it's fine, you know, if it inspires you. It doesn't really matter if it's literally true or not. Um, you know, relics are a similar thing. Are they really relics of the Buddha? But if they inspire you, if you feel like a sense of, ah, oh, this is the Buddha's relics. I sat with the Buddha's bones in New Delhi in the museum. Apparently they're the Buddha's bones and they're bones, you know, I was, I don't know, I didn't expect anything, but again, ooh, the tears coming out down my eyes, I was so moved. It's like, could these actually be the Buddha's bones? And it's like, they're bones, human bones. They don't look special, <laughs> but it's this idea, wow, <laughs> this really was a human being, a living being. Amazing. So yeah, I don't really care if they really are or not, but it was just still. It, had, it, it brought up a lot of uh, inspiration and I was really very moved. So that's the important thing. Which way are these things sending your mind? If it just creates faith, um, confusion and doubt, then just ignore that sort of, like Ajahn Brahmani said, right? Just choose the ones that speak to you. Okay, seems like there's a few coming in. I'm quite new to Buddhism and meditation, and today I've reflected on meditation framework from faith to samadhi to knowledge of ending. Some of the states seem familiar somehow, but experiencing life to the max, I've become disillusioned with the worldly pursuits. The current feeling is like a neutral emptiness. I'm not sure what to make of it. Any ideas, please? Yeah, it's probably quite natural um, when we start to realize that, yeah, we're a little bit disillusioned with life. The initial um, feeling you have or we can have is sort of 
a little bit blank because we haven't yet started to experience the benefits of that disillusionment. We're just sort of dropping the things that are agitating. So the mind is maybe even a bit dull, um, like you say, sort of neutral emptiness, um, which is already not a bad place <laughs> to be. Um, but I think as we practice this path, it's like the lights turn up in the mind and we start to see that in that neutrality, um, there's actually a certain amount of peace. And after a while, when we get into the meditation, things like confidence and inspiration and joy start to arise, that starts, we start to incline and tune up and connect with that more and more. So it's not that you're sort of left with nothing <laughs> initially, you actually go through a process of increasing happiness and inspiration. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. It sounds very good in a sense, in the sense that you know, you're know you letting go of things or you have already let go of things and you're realizing that. Um, and you're not distraught or despairing, which is, you know, also can happen. Um, it reminds me a little bit of when I started to experience like things just ceasing a lot in, in terms of the physical sensations. Like there are these sort of, it's in the Abhidhamma more than it is in the suttas, but it's like you start to see the passing away of things much more than the arising. And at first it was a little bit like, oh, there'll be nothing left, like there is nothing really. And it was kind of a little bit challenging, but also I was quite peaceful with it. But it wasn't like, I don't know, it wasn't sort of, in a way it was insightful and it, it did feel really meaningful, but it wasn't necessarily joyful. But that came later when the kind of subtle disappointment, I suppose, with life started to um, fade away because I, I started to accept, okay, so this is the nature of things, you know? And then, uh, and then it was quite a relief and a lot of happiness started to come up. Actually, it's probably mostly with, um, the samadhi practice and metta practice that I experienced more of the pleasure and the happiness and joy of meditation. Yeah. But even as I was saying in this meditation, peace, the absence of suffering can also be quite pleasurable once we tune up to it. It's like our eyes are, you know, not accustomed to, to that just yet. They need to get attuned. So someone's asking about um, the Buddhist perspective on trauma and what to do when past traumatic experiences arise during meditation. And I don't think there is a lot of description of trauma in the Buddhist texts, actually. So my understanding of what to do when these traumatic experiences arise is more from what I've sort of come to myself and maybe from asking some teachers and just sort of contemplating it myself and, and also teaching people who have had um, some trauma and the way that it might manifest in their body. Um, I think it can particularly come up when we are working with the body, but even in a way it can when we're working with the breath, because these things tend to get sort of stuck in our psyche and they manifest energetically through the body and through the breath. And I personally think it's not advisable to then try to practice samatha, like try to still the mind at that point. I think it's much better if we can learn to find a way to um, hold those experiences, at least for a while, um, so that we can kind of give them a very gentle but unobtrusive sort of company, um, but also know how to back off when it becomes too strong. So again, for me, it's one of the things that's really helpful by adding kindness to mindfulness. So rather than just staying with the trauma, which can actually cause more of a like negative feedback loop um, because the mind is actually reacting, even if you think you're just being aware, it's actually unpleasant. I would say to really, really soften the mind and use a lot of self-compassion with that. And if it starts to sort of intensify to the point where you feel like it's re-traumatizing you to either open your eyes you know, and just ground yourself, look at the ground for a while, um, just feel your body, feel the extremities, maybe the hands, the feet, the palms of the hands are really good. Um, get more of a like overall sense of your body, don't get sucked into that particular part of the body or the thinking process or whatever that's re-traumatizing. 
So especially if the traumatic experience is arising as thinking, I think it can be helpful to actually, um, you can try to work with it in meditation. For example, you could start to repeat some phrases of loving kindness or compassion to yourself to break through that negative thought cycle. Or you could just say, okay, I'm gonna just get up now, change my posture, have a drink of tea or whatever, sit down, calm myself, and maybe do some walking meditation for a while, yeah? So don't stay with it if the sitting is, is intensifying it. There's something called trituration, I think, whereby, I think it's used in psychology and maybe trauma release. I mean, I'm not an expert in these things, but it's basically about tapping into things only for a short time. So if something's very difficult, you kind of tiptoe in, you spend a bit of time with it, but then it gets too much and you just move out again. A bit like putting your toe in a very cold lake, you know, you don't just put your whole body in the lake, you put your toe in, you check out, is that okay? Okay, my toe can handle it, but now that's enough, I come out. So in the same way you can like broaden, narrow and broaden your focus energetically in the body and also in life. So if you're sitting there and you feel like things are just caving in, open your senses up, you know, maybe go outside. This is also a good thing to do. I mean, I also sometimes have strong emotions. I mean, we all do, right? Coming up and it happened to me once at um, Jana Grove in Australia. And I was speaking to Ajahn Brahm and I don't know, sometimes, you know, there's just something, <laughs> if somebody doesn't say the right thing, you feel more triggered. And so I was getting this kind of sense of like, almost like a rising panic, like just really upset. And he just like looked out of the window and he's, oh, such a beautiful light on the trees that's swaying in the breeze and look at the golden sunlight. And I just kind of looked out and it was like, oh yeah, it's like a circuit breaker. <laughs> you know, you just kind of take yourself out of your overwhelming experience for a while and get a perspective again, get connected to nature. So I say get out, do some walking as well. Mm -hmm. I hope that helps a bit. So never, never push it. You know, always go very gently, very, very gently. What was the last sutta I read out after Anguttara 853? Uh, it was Anguttara 783. Yeah, 783. That's called, uh, well... In the English translation, it's just called the teaching, but it's probably should be called a Pali Sutta or something. It's the teaching to Venerable Upali. Mm. But actually the teaching is quite nice as well. It's just probably the word Dhamma. This is how you can know that it's the Dhamma. Okay. Thank you, Venerable. It was very calming and inspiring. It felt like you were talking to me directly. That's nice as I had some challenging personal practice time. Very uplifting, sadhu, excellent. That's good. And even when these things don't work, that's also good, right? Because they don't always work straight away. Still, we're turning our mind to the Dhamma. Still, we're, you know, having good input. Good input can never hurt. Even if we don't get the benefits straight away, you know. Bit by bit, we're just making the right choice as to what to do. Because you could have had a challenging person practice time and thought, you know, I don't want to do this anymore, or like, I'm not going to come to the talk. So, you know, you decided, you decided to keep on giving an ear to the Dhamma. So that's really wonderful. And yeah, sometimes times are challenging, other times it's smoother, but it changes all the time. We can never measure our progress by whether it's difficult or, or easy. Sometimes the most challenging retreats maybe don't even give us a happy feeling straight after the retreat, but in our life, we start to notice, wow, something really changed since then, you know? Other times we have a beautiful, peaceful, blissful experience on retreat, and afterwards we feel sort of disappointed, and it doesn't have so much effect on our life. So it's impossible to measure these things. It's always a accumulation or a culmination of all the good things you do in the practice and in your daily life. So, yeah. And if it is challenging for anyone during the personal practice period, do be creative. You know, if you're tired, have a little rest, go outside, do some walking meditation, be with the trees, whatever it is that, you know, supports you. That's why it is a personal period. Okay. 
how do we respond when friends or relations notice our, notice our kind deeds, but what we do makes them feel bad about themselves? <laughs> how can we ensure not to breed resentment amongst others? You cannot, basically. That's not our job. Our job is not to breed resentment within ourselves. We cannot change others. We cannot even send them meta in the hope that they will change or start to like us or feel better about themselves. Meta and you know developing forgiveness rather than resentment are always our own personal jobs. This is what we have to do for ourselves. And over time, the effects will spill over onto others, especially if it's genuine. If it's really genuine, then after a while, People, I do relate to that. I mean, I have also felt that in my family from time to time that, you know, because I'm on maybe a different path, that it maybe highlights to other people that perhaps there are things in their life that they're not quite sure about, or, you know, did we make the right choices? Did she make the right choice? Or was there something we did that made her make that choice? Or, <laughs> you know, these are natural things, especially when we're very close to others. You know, usually when we're close to people, we're close to people who do similar things to us. You know, especially in our friendship circles or our teachers, we often choose those who are like us. But with family, it's not always that way. Um, and especially when we start to change, it can be a little bit threatening or intimidating. But I don't really think it's that they feel so, I mean, they might feel bad about themselves in a sense. Um, sometimes it can also be that they're a little bit afraid that you are now judging them or that you won't like them anymore or that you're moving away from them in some way and that can sometimes be the reaction like oh maybe she thinks I'm like this or like that and so in that sense I think the more you are able to continue the kind deeds they start to feel safer around you especially if you can do those kind deeds without judging them, without expecting them to do the same, then over time they start to think, hmm, actually she's still here, she's still with us, she's not judging us. Um, she seems to be changing, I wonder what she's up to. And then they start to ask you, you know. <laughs> but yeah, we can't not breed resentment amongst others. And if we're always trying to keep other people happy and keep them pleased, then we're never going to be able to be really true to our own path. So I think, you know, walking on our own path takes a lot of courage and a lot of resolve. And um, it is precisely that commitment and resolve that in the end wins people over because they think, well, if she's so committed or if he's so committed to this, there must be something in it. You know, how come it's lasting through all the ups and downs? You know, how come they're still doing this? Even we might not see any particular positive effect on this person, but there must be something, otherwise they wouldn't still be at it, you know? So they start to get curious after a while. Yeah. So don't try to take other people's reactions on. Just see that you're being kind. Maybe analyze a little bit closer and see if you can perhaps um, try not to be judgmental as far as possible, because I know in the beginning, I used to sort of want to tell everyone about it. And I did feel a bit superior. And I used to judge my family and call them carnivores and things like that, <laughs> which is not very nice. <laughs> so yeah, but after a while, we realized that's really not the way <laughs> to win anyone over to the Dhamma. They just think, oh my goodness, how arrogant they've become. So. <laughs> Okay. Uh, someone said thanks for mentioning that thought about thoughts that even the Buddha had that problem I never heard that thank you and earlier on I was thinking to read it because especially for the person who asked that question um, about thinking I thought it might be encouraging actually to hear that straight from the Buddha so all my suttas are next to me. You should see me. I'm surrounded by all these suttas. <laughs> it's quite nice. So he says, before my enlightenment, and this is the Buddha, right? <laughs> so it's not long ago. While I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, it occurred to me. Suppose I divide my thoughts into two classes or two categories. Then I set on one side thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of cruelty. And I set on the other side thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of non-ill will, and thoughts of non-cruelty. As I abided thus, diligent, ardent, and resolute, 
a thought of sensual desire arose in me. Mm -hmm. Even though he was diligent, ardent and resolute, even though he was the Buddha, even though he would get enlightened a few years later, still a thought of sensual desire arose. Then he considered, this leads to my own affliction, to others' affliction, and to the affliction of both. It obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties, and leads away from Nibbana. So he didn't say, I'm so terrible, this is awful, this shouldn't be happening, I'm making bad karma. He didn't say that. He just said, okay, so this is causing suffering, right? It's just about suffering and the end of suffering. That's all. And because he noticed it was causing suffering, it started to subside. And it was the same thing with the other thoughts. The thought of ill will arose and a thought of cruelty arose in a Buddha to be. He realized this leads to my own affliction, to others' affliction and to the affliction of both. It obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties and leads away from Nibbana. So the person who also asked about thoughts here knows that. They know that it leads away from Nibbana. That is enough. You know that it leads away. And in time, it will just disappear. You know, sometimes these things can be caused by old habits. Sometimes they can be caused by even chemical imbalances in the body, which are physical, which you can address with medication if you are suffering from severe depression or anything else. You know, it's not a personal failing to have these thoughts. Sometimes we have these thoughts because life is really hard, you know, and we, we're having thoughts that in a way make it harder. But the hardest thing is when we judge ourselves for that, because then we're just piling on suffering onto suffering. So it's much better to just see, okay, this thought has arisen, it's not good for me. Um, and just let it subside. It will subside in time. Mm -hmm. When you're not absolutely inundated with difficult thoughts, you know, if there's still some thinking and you feel like your mind is ready, you could choose to practice metta meditation and you know, use some positive, skillful thoughts. You know, you can't do it if your mind is really out of control. The Buddha said, you know, wait until the hindrances do not obsess your mind. But um, you can certainly start to substitute. If you see that you're heading down the wrong way, you can just say, oh, you know, may I be happy? May I be free from suffering? May I be peaceful? And you just say it with sincerity, you know, um, you offer those thoughts to yourself without expecting anything in return, otherwise it's not loving kindness. You just say those thoughts because you know they're skillful. And over time, you just keep going, keep going, keep going. And it's amazing how it starts to bring about a different emotion in the mind. It's really amazing how the mind is so connected, our thinking is so connected to our emotional world. You know, It can really lead to some blissful experiences in meditation. I've practiced with metta before where I just started, you know, practicing with the phrases and three hours later, I'm like, wow, I, I don't want to get up, you know, <laughs> I'm just like really getting a lot of metta. And uh, it just builds over time. It just builds because you're keeping your mind protected from unwholesome things. And you, you know, you're putting in these wholesome things. And when the causes are ripe, then it just starts to actually change your emotional world and cultivate a real emotion of metta, loving kindness. So the mind is malleable. The mind is not a fixed thing. The mind is always changing. And because of that, we can shape it in wholesome ways. So this is really a wonderful thing about the human mind and about the Dhamma. But don't fight with yourself, you know. That metta suggestion is just for times that you feel relatively at ease. You know, you can also, as I keep saying, do some of that before you sleep. I always love it as well because it has the aspect of service co-joined with it. Sometimes just meditating for myself, it's like, yeah, okay, well, who really cares if I do this or not? I mean, if I don't feel I'm benefiting much, I might not as, as well not meditate, right? We can sometimes think like that. But if you're practicing metta, I remember the first time I did a, 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 you know, intensive in the sense that it was, I focused entirely on metta for the whole retreat. It was, I think, two weeks. And um, I practiced metta towards somebody who'd actually sponsored my ticket to get to the retreat. So I kept bringing her up in my mind with this big smile on her face. And she was just there for the whole retreat. And I was sending metta, metta, metta. 
And it was just so wonderful. You know, I just felt like it was so easy to do it because I felt like I was serving as well as meditating for myself. I wasn't really concerned with whether the meta was working, how I was feeling. I was just concerned in actually sending her meta. So my mind was on others and this helps the letting go. It becomes giving rather than thinking about gaining. You know, it becomes meditation to let go, not to attain. So metta's amazing because there's so much wisdom in there. You know, it really does conduce to letting go. Actually, earlier somebody said, is metta the opposite of craving? And Ajahn, Pram, Ajahn Pramali said, um, letting go is the opposite of craving. But letting go is metta and metta is letting go. You know, when you love, when you really love, you let things be, you let people go. Love gives things freedom, love gives things up. Love just gives. So the two are very close. <laughs> Good, so thanks for that lovely comment. I'll read it out because it's nice. I felt so many times this evening that you've been speaking to my heart and mind and how I've been feeling today. Thank you for helping us recharge our Dhamma batteries. Wonderful. And that's the thing. Sometimes it speaks to our hearts. Sometimes some of it does. Sometimes somebody else's Dhamma speaks to our heart. This is why we need a big Dhamma cake so that we can all take a piece from wherever, <laughs> wherever we want to take it from. Yeah. We need a lot of variety, I think, in terms of teachers, teachings. But definitely I am very confident when I'm teaching from... Um, as close as I can, you know, to the Buddha's teachings, as you know, I'm very confident to be able to share. Um, I'm confident in sharing the Buddha's teachings because he is the real teacher, right? So this is really wonderful. This is why it works. Good. So thank you all for being here and for the sincerity of your practice. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again very soon. So take care and sleep well and spread a little loving kindness, maybe a little forgiveness to yourself, to anyone else before you sleep. Sad, sad, sad. Ooh. I'm not making it too loud because of the audience beyond, <laughs> beyond this room. But yes, it's something that we do in our tradition, in Ajahn Brahm's tradition anyway. And the sadhu means awesome. And uh, traditionally it's kind of said in monasteries like sadhu, sadhu. It's a bit of a dirge sometimes. Maybe it's sincere sometimes too, but it can be a bit boo. So Ajahn Brahm's personality is to try and put joy into things. So he has this crazy sadhu that like, yeah, get very joyful and celebratory. So <laughs> that's why we do it that way. Good. Good night, everyone.